There are many challenging shots in every round of golf, but none seem to be more difficult than getting off of the tee. It is the first one that you hit on every hole, and it tends to set the tone for those that follow. Whether it's a par three, four, or five, how you get off the tee is a very important factor in how you'll score. So today, our PGA professionals are going to reveal their favorite tips, tactics, and techniques to help you find the fairway more often and give you more confidence when you tee it up. Mike Malaska and Dr. Gary Wyron are two of the country's top teachers, and you'll soon see why as they share their best lessons to help you hit it farther, straighter, and with more consistency than you ever thought possible. You'll also discover routines that will help you practice more effectively and drills that will help you prepare for your next round. When you're standing here ready to hit a tee shot, it's a good idea to be able to know thyself, meaning that you ought to be able to evaluate your drives, your tendencies, because I'm facing a hole now where there is a big bunker on the right and the wind's blowing a little bit across left to right and my tendency, let's say if I were the most common golfer around, it would be to fade or slice the ball a little bit. Well, if that's the case, knowing my tendency, then I'd better adjust to fit that tendency. Now, I start first by my location on the tee. You always tee the ball closest to the trouble. If the bunker's on the right, there's water on the right, there's out of bounds on the right, you tee to the right to hit away from it. So I'm going to tee the ball here on the right side of the fairway. And then knowing that I tend to slice or fade the ball a little bit, I'm going to aim well up the left side because I can't tell you how many players I've been with in pro-ams who've hit six, seven slices right in a row into the woods, and yet they still stand up there and aim down the middle. It makes no sense. So here we are. I'm evaluating. I'm looking up the fairway here, and I'm seeing where I want to drive the ball. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is to talk to you about getting some confidence up here, keeping it simple. One of the great players of all time in the PGA Hall of Fame. His name was Chick Harbert. He won 53 long drive contests on the tour when they used to have them on Tuesdays to bring people out before the tournament started to get a little gallery out there and they would have a long drive contest. It was a lot of fun. He could really hit it. And the two of us are playing together one time and he said, Gary, would you like the secret to driving the ball in the wind? Because right now we have, a, we have a wind out here, and sometimes it can be dead into you, sometimes behind you. And he says, well, I'll give you, I said, sure. And he says, I'll give you the tip. First of all, driving the ball into the wind. When the wind is in your face coming this way, what you want to do is just make your very best swing and make solid contact. He says, now when you're playing downwind, swinging the other way, what you should do is make your very best swing and make solid contact. <laughs> uh, it's kind of fun. It's kind of like a joke in a way, but it isn't a joke. It's maybe one of the best things I've ever heard in golf. Instead of trying to do stuff all the time, oh, I'm going to try to do this or keep it here, do that. Make your very best swing and make solid contact. How do I do that personally in playing? Well, I like to rehearse again the golf swing above the ball when there's no ball there. Back and through. See, free flowing, allowing it to fly, let her go. And when I'm doing that, I'm not thinking about details. I'm not holding back. I'm letting her fly. If, if I could give the right impression to you about that as far as grip pressure is concerned when you do that, it's kind of like this. You wind up, unwind, and let her go. <laughs> Now, I threw it right down the middle, by the way. It takes a little bit of practice, but the idea is to not squeeze so much, and that's what I get when I swing it above the ball up here. So, putting it all together. I visualized it. I see what I wanted to see out there. I know my tendency. I know where I'm going to aim it. I get behind. I tee it in the right place. We wind, unwind, let her go, and then go through your routine every time. Grip, distance from the ball, aim, set up, Wind, unwind, and let her go. And I hope that is something that will help you to have more confidence when you get on the tee and to be able to hit better tee shots. Evaluate and improve your drives. Play to your tendencies. 
Swing steady to maintain rhythm and balance. Go through your pre-shot routine every time. When it comes to creating posture that gives you the best chance for maximum distance and consistency or control, there's a couple of things that I see most everybody does incorrectly. Now, a lot of it's because, some of it anyways, is because of what you see on TV, and so you end up forcing posture. That's almost as bad as bad posture. So let's talk a little bit about finding the best position for you to be in to give you the best chance to get the most out of your swing. If I take this club and I set it on my back as I'm standing to the ball and I put the base of the club at the top of my hips and I let the club just touch the middle of my back, the distance that that club is from my head now, when I bend to the ball, that relationship doesn't change. What I see with a lot of people is one of two things. Either they set up and as they bend to the ball, they round their shoulders and flex their knees. That puts your back in what they call flexion. So now your spine's really tight and you can't turn, so you'll pull up out of it, all kinds of things. I also see the other mistake where they take their normal posture and they say, oh, I see Tiger and these guys with flat back, so now I'm going to force a posture, I'm going to get my back flat, I'm going to tip over. Now there's so much tension in your body, you can't move either. So the key here with posture, as far as the bend goes, is you take your normal standing posture, and if you put a club on your back, you put the club on your back, your normal posture, now the bend is going to come from your hips. So you feel like you push your hips back, then there's a slight flex in your knees, and now because your right hand's going to be a little lower on the club, there's a slight tilt in your spine away from the target, just slight. A little more with the driver than with your irons. So, when we get the posture, let's talk about this again because it's really critical that you understand what happens. If you bend too much from your shoulders, you put your back in flexion. So now it's really tight. It's hard to turn. You make a backswing, you'll lift up out of it. So you can't keep your spine angle or your posture. If you force your posture to where it's not natural, even though it might look pretty good, as you start to swing, there's so much tension you give out and now you're out of your spine angle again. So when you get up to the ball, it's going to be like you had a club in your normal standing posture. You're going to bend. Then from there, if I set the club in, a little flex in my knees and a little tilt, now I'm ready to go. That'll give you the best chance to rotate, maintain your spine angle, and hit the best shot you can hit from a very good posture. Set up for power. Take your normal standing posture, bending at hips. Don't round your shoulders when making bend. Don't unnaturally force your posture. When it comes to hitting off the tee, most of the time you're going to be hitting a driver. If not, then the longest club that you can hit with confidence. And if you ask the typical golfer what he wants to achieve off the tee, you're either going to hear, I want to hit it farther, or I want to hit it straighter. The holy grail of golf. Neither is impossible to improve in your game if you listen closely to the advice of our PGA professionals. Mike and Gary have some fantastic tips on how to improve your accuracy and distance, and some great drills on how to make you hit it longer and straighter. Distance. Never met a golfer who wouldn't like to hit the ball a little bit farther. And you know there are only two factors really which cause distance, and that is club head speed and centeredness of contact. Let me show you a few things that will help you with that, but let me have you understand that this is not kind of hypothetical horse hockey we're talking about. Because at age 47, I hit it 381 yards and one foot in national long driving contest and won by over 50 yards. That's a record that stood for some 25 years. So what I'm telling you will work. First of all, let's take a look at the idea of strength and flexibility because strength and flexibility is the human part that makes this club swing, that gets you to get speed. You see, you can't win an Indianapolis 500 in a Volkswagen. You don't have enough horsepower. You need strength 
is the horsepower part. Flexibility is the delivery part, so that you can wind it up and unwind it. Now, I'm going to take a tool here. This is called an assist. An assist helps me in a, several ways, actually. One has got a form grip where I can put my hands on in the correct position. It is a weighted club at the end, so that when I swing it, I start picking up extra strength that I would normally not have just swinging a regular golf club. And it has a bend in the shaft that helps kick it over so the club face will square up and release on the other side. So swinging something that is a weighted device, I like to swing also a power swing fan. It's a four-bladed fan that gives you great strength in your forearms and great technique to rotate through the ball. So strength is an important part of it. This also helps you to stretch. When you swing it back with the weight, it stretches you further. See, some people take it back, they can only get the club back to here. But with a weighted device, it pulls you a little extra farther back. And so for that reason, it's good also. Now the speed part of it. Just to demonstrate it to you so that you can hear what we're talking about, this is like auditory learning, I'm taking a raw shaft and I'm going to swing it with a tight grip. You hear very, very little, maybe a faint sound. As I lighten my grip, you're starting to hear what is speed. It's a whooshing sound. And I'll lighten it even further. Wow, that's really singing right through there. Well, that's part of the technique factor. You can't squeeze something tightly and get speed. So I'm letting it kind of winding it, unwinding, and feeling it a letting go feeling. So that's part of the speed. You can do the same thing with a driver. You can take it and hold it upside down and listen for a whooshing sound. Listen here. Whoosh, you hear that noise? Now, if you're gri gripping it too tightly, you just won't hear that speed. And therefore, it's important for you to understand that grip pressure has an influence on speed as well. So, we've got centeredness of contact, and we're gonna show you exactly where we hit the ball here by putting on a decal on the face and it'll tell you whether you had centeredness of contact or not. Now this shot was pretty good from the high to low part because the new drivers today actually go a little farther when you hit it slightly above the center. But it's a little toward the heel and that means that it probably faded a little bit and lost maybe 10 yards. So with those factors, good technique that'll provide you the opportunity not only have a delayed hit at the bottom, and the delayed hit comes this way with a drill. The delayed hit looks in the, in, as though your club and the shaft, your left arm, the shaft of the club, and right down to the head are a straight line at impact. That is gonna be the greatest speed. Most players, because they're trying to hit the ball, release it too early and they have an angle and their greatest speed is back here somewhere. Listen how a high handicapper sounds. You hear a whoosh. Where do you hear it? You hear it back here. They ought to take the tee and the ball and peg it back there. That's where they're getting their greatest speed. But a low handicapper sounds like this. That's where the speed is. It's almost out to in front. You see the target's out there. It's not here on the ground. You're trying to swing the club there, and that's where you're going to help you to get that greatest speed. So we've got it put together now with centeredness of contact, with club head speed, with some drills to do it. You're going to be able to deliver a swing that produces a shot, maybe not 381 yards, but a lot further than you've ever hit it, something like this. So there you have it, the two principles, centeredness and speed, some equipment to do it, some drills to do it. You do those and you're gonna increase your drive off the tee. Here we are on the tee and now we're gonna talk about what everybody wants, which is distance. There's a couple of things though you've gotta be careful when you try to get distance. Number one, distance doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a really good player, because if you can't find the ball after you hit it, your scores still aren't going to be that good. The reality is, on a 6,000-yard golf course, if you let me just hit 150-yard shots, I'm a single-digit handicap only hitting it that far. Now, my short game's pretty good. 
So distance is only as important as you can control where the ball goes. But let's get back to maxing out your distance. We've got all this technology. I mean, club manufacturers are phenomenal. They've got these heads, weighted systems. This is the best we can possibly have in technology and golf balls. They've done everything they can do for you. But even then, when you create speed with this club head, you've got to get the speed into the golf ball. That becomes the key. Most of you have enough speed to play at a high level. You don't control the face to max out that speed. So it doesn't get translated into the ball. So if we're going to do that, we've got to figure out how can we max out the speed that we have. For that, I'm going to give you a couple of drills so we can get a feel for what we're doing here. When we come to the drills, here's what we're going to do. The first drill is called a balk drill. And what you're going to do is you're going to set up to the ball, you're going to make a back swing, and then come right down to the ball and stop before you hit it. You're going to do that twice. Then the third time you make your back swing and you come down, and instead of stopping, you just let the club accelerate through the ball. It goes like this. Now, if you notice there, I didn't swing really hard. What I did was I squared the club face on the back of the ball. So all of that drill that I was working on was teaching my body to move and my hands and arms to control the face. So I made square impact with the club face to the back of the ball. Now, I'm sure most of you have stood up on a hole where there's a lake out there and you're going to lay up. You've got the wrong club. So you say, oh, I'm just going to swing easy at this one. And you make a swing and hit it, and you're going, oh, no, no, stop, stop, and it goes in the lake. And you go, I wish I could do that all the time. Well, the reality of that is when you back off to that speed and you square the club face on the ball, you hit it a lot further than you think it would have gone. See, the key here is not to create more effort. Effort doesn't equate into distance. Effort equates into effort. The tour players use about 50% less muscle activity than an average 15 handicapper. So it's, a, it's about maxing out what you have. Now, we've got another drill here that's going to really help you to take this balk drill another step further. Okay, what we're going to do is I'm going to make a swing, and I'm going to hit the first ball 125 yards with a full swing. Then I'm going to hit it 175 with the next one, and then 250 with the last one. Now, what I want you to pay attention here is pay attention to the pace that I take it away and the change of directions. Now, what you're going to notice is they're not going to be any different. The big mistake that most of you make, as soon as we give you this instrument here, you grip it tighter and you want to hit it further, so the instinct is to take it away faster, start it down faster, and then you lose everything at the ball. So you don't hit the ball with your backswing. So the backswing sets you up. So the first one here is going to be 125. Full swing. Carried about 125. The next one, we're going to go out to 175. Now this one we're going to go about to 250. Now again, watch the pace of the backswing and the change of directions. There's not a lot of difference. So when you watch that, where is the speed happening? It's not in the takeaway and it's not in the change of directions. So if you do that and you make a swing and you come back to the ball and you hit it solid, and you finish the swing, you're going to get a lot of distance. So to wrap this whole thing up, here's where we are with this game. To get more distance, you need to maximize the club head speed you already have. To maximize that speed, you first have to understand how to sequence things into the ball. So the balk drill becomes a really good way to feel how to sequence the club face and your body to square it at impact. The last one, to build up the speed, you gradually increase the speed at the bottom, not in your takeaway and not in the change of directions. If you'll spend a little bit of time with those two drills, I think you'll be amazed at how far you can hit the ball. And not only that, you may find it now after you hit it. Maximum distance off the tee. 
two keys are club head speed and centerness of contact. Lighten your grip pressure to generate speed. Swing speed should come at the bottom of your swing. Focus on squaring the club face at impact. Now we're going to talk about accuracy. Accuracy is all about being able to control the club face onto the golf ball. And when I see most people, one major thing they don't understand about accuracy is the ability to control this face. And it basically comes in your lead arm. One drill that I have everybody do when they come to see just how much of this they have, I have them set up. They're going to make a swing with just their left arm and hit the golf ball. When I do that, most really good players, there's no problem. They can do that every single time, 100, 125 yards, the little draw. Most amateurs have no idea and no control of this left arm. And that left arm basically is the one that's controlling and stabilizing the face. Now your right arm is important too. It's putting speed and putting pressure into the back of the shaft, into the back of the ball. But both arms have a role. And if this arm doesn't know what to do, your ability to control or have accuracy goes down dramatically. So let's talk about a drill that all of us can do to try to feel the difference in how that left arm works to hit different shots. What we're going to do is just called right hand off after impact. What you're going to do is you're going to make a swing and you're going to come down into the ball and right about at impact you let your right hand come off. So your left hand has to continue to control the face through the ball. Now the first shot we're going to hit, the left arm's not going to rotate, so it's going to come through and you're going to hit a slice. Most of you will have no trouble with this because you've perfected that move. So you go back and there's your slice. The next one you're going to make a back swing. This time you're going to come down and you're going to rotate your left arm right back to square. So this ball is going to go straight. The last one you're going to set up, you're going to make a back swing, you're going to come down and you're going to rotate your left arm earlier to make the ball curve to the left. Now you start to have a feel and because your right side's not so overpowering in the downswing, you start to understand how that left arm rotates through the ball. Now to add to this, one of the big misconceptions about golf is this late release, hold the angle. Well, I'm not going to disagree that that doesn't happen. But what you have to understand is there's some things that you have to feel to make that picture show up and still be able to square the club face on the ball. In a golf swing, as you swing up to the top, your left arm gradually and continually rotates to the top. Now, once you get to the top, when you go to start down, you don't hold, 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 hold the rotation off and at the last minute try to figure out how to flip. That's never going to work. You're up to the top, and when you start down, this left arm gradually and continually is rotating down into the ball. Because you have a club in your hand, as you start down, your left arm and the left side of your body is starting to unwind and rotate, but the club is staying right on plane. Now when the club gets down in here, now you've got all this torque and strength build up, wham, it takes off and goes. So understanding that the left arm rotates to the top and gradually and continually rotates to the ball is an important thing to be able to have accuracy and control the face. That's something that everybody needs to spend a little bit of time practicing. A good way to practice that, just set up with just your left arm with your thumb up, point your thumb in the sky, point your thumb back to the ball so you feel the timing of that rotation. Now. The other misconception that we have relative to accuracy is our bo lower bodies get so quick. How you use your right leg becomes an important part of being able to be accurate with the golf swing. The right leg, when you get to the top, you're supported here. Now I hear all the time, get off your right side, get to your left. So people end up getting so fast off this leg that the club is so far behind they can't catch up. Your right leg, basically, from the top, as you start down, this is your support, and you're pushing down into the ground. So you're pushing into the ground. This leg is straightening and pressuring the ground. That pushes you up into your left side. But you're continually staying into the ground. You don't want to jump off the ground right out of the top of your swing. If you do, your body will get so far ahead of you, it'll be very difficult to catch the face up. 
So it's a stabilizer. You push into the ground, and that pressure, this leg is pushing and straightening all the way into the ball. Then your glute muscles contract. Then your hips unwind, and your leg stays fairly straight. So if you're trying to drive your knees or jump off your right foot, that's probably a big reason that you're losing a lot of accuracy. So if you'll do that, your base will stay a lot better. It'll make it easier to use your hands and arms. Now, the last thing. You probably wonder why I have a chair here. This chair becomes a very good way for most people to practice to feel how the club releases in front of them. Now, when you swing a golf club, there's a lot of rotation, but there's a timing of that rotation. It's called acceleration and deceleration patterns. What it means, you start to unwind from the ground, then you slow down in your feet, knees, and hips. Then your shoulders start to catch up, they slow down. Then your arms take off and pass. What most people do is they get to the top and they violently unwind everything, which leaves the club way behind and they can't ever catch the face up. When you sit in a chair, if I were to sit in a chair and make a swing, it's very difficult for me to jump my hips and my body way too far. I can make a little bit of move. This is support. My shoulders start, but then they slow down and give me time to catch up with my hands and arms. That little move right there, the timing of that is what you see in all good players when they're standing up. So if you just sit in a chair and make some swings, and then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to hit three balls. I'm going to start and hit the first ball. I'm going to hit it about 125 yards. So I'm going to make a back swing. It's about 125. Now we're going to set up here a little closer to this next. Now I'm going to make this one go about 175. Now, as I'm swinging, I'm creating a little more speed, but if you can see, my hips aren't jumping way out ahead of it. I'm making a little more swing. I'm setting my base, so I've got something to hit up against, and then my arms are accelerated past my chest. You can't pull the club through with your chest. Now we're going out to about 225. So I'll make a little better backswing. Stay braced. Now I had a little more follow through, but the follow through came because of the momentum of the club. When it comes to creating distance and accuracy, and you're looking for both, the accuracy comes in your ability to control the face. If your body gets too active before your hands and arms know what to do, you'll never be very accurate with your shots. So make sure you practice both distance and accuracy, because without both, you really can't play that well. It's great to be able to hit long drives, but I must admit that during my career, I got beat quite often by gentlemen that could hit it only within 40 yards of where I was hitting it off the tee. But they were consistent, they were accurate. So accuracy is extremely important in golf because remember the final resting place you want for your ball is only four and a quarter inches in diameter. So what we're going to do now is talk to you about the two things that cause the ball to go straight or to its target. And those are path and face. Path. I'm going to use a tool here called a self-teaching board. The self-teaching board gives me, with colors on it, gives me a picture, a visual of the path that the club should take. You see, rather than getting into details and say, now, drop your arm here and put your hand there and do this, move your body here, if you can swing this club, visually see it go over green to blue, then you are swinging your club from the inside. And why from the inside? Because when you swing from the outside, you've thrown away some of your power already. When you swing from the inside, you're still retaining your power until the last moment, the moment of truth, and that's when you release it. Now, to do that, to come from the inside, you need to be looking at the green, your club going over the green, and toward the blue. You say, wait a minute, that doesn't look like inside down the line inside. That looks like inside out, but it really isn't. There's a factor here called parallax. 
And parallax means that you, because you're standing in an angle away from it, what you see is not what you actually have happening with a club head. What you need to see is inside to over to the outside in order for it to go inside down the line to the target. So I practice over the pat over the self-teaching board, green to blue, green to blue. It's amazing how I can get a student who's swinging from red to yellow, the slicers and the short hitters path, red to yellow, and say, well, I put the self-teaching board down there. I'll, I'll see you in 15 minutes. Keep practicing green to blue and hit some shots. It's a self-teaching board, so you can do it without having to be so someone there to tell you. I also can do this. I put three T's out here in front of my shot that I'm going to hit, and I can swing the club so that it comes from inside and out over the tees. Now, to see it coming from the inside, I've made my ball uh, have uh, the lines to make a quadrant on it. And the idea is hit the inside quadrant right here. That means your club has to be coming from the inside in order to hit the ball. So a, a teaching board like this, which is a learning aid, or something you have right in your bag, either way, gets you to get the right path. Now, what about the face? Well, here's the most popular teaching aid in the world for golf professionals. 75,000 of these have been sold, and golf professionals use them for all kinds of things, but the basic idea was always the same, which was to get the club face back to the moment of truth. Not only the club face, but your body. You can sense, because it has resistance, where are my arm, where are my feet, where's my balance, where's my head. I can feel at that very moment, if I am there, when I strike the golf ball, it's going to go straight. So I put the two together like that. Put the bag over the board. We put some support behind the bag. When I'm teaching, I simply put my foot back there. Or we put some raw shafts there. And the Student stands here and swings green to blue, inside to square, inside to square, the inside quadrant of the ball out over the blue and out to the target. When you do that, you'll be amazed how much more accurate you will be because you have learned the moment of truth for accuracy. Secrets to tee box Accuracy the key to controlling face at impact comes from the right arm. To generate feel, hit balls by releasing the backhand at impact. The swing should come from the inside. To practice, divide the ball into four equal parts and aim for the inside rear quadrant. I'm on the tee of a demanding par four and the distance that I need to hit it doesn't necessarily suit my driver. In the game of golf, a lot of strokes are wasted not by what happens from the tee to the green, but by what happens between these. Ben Crenshaw once said that the most important distance in the game of golf is the distance between your ears. Poor decisions up here lead to poor club selection, poor strategy, and inferior course management. What I see a lot in pro-ams is players walk up onto the tee of a par 4 or par 5 and automatically reach for the driver, tee it up in the middle of the tee, and aim down the middle of the fairway. When they might be better off with a three wood, teeing up on either side of the tee, aiming away from the middle of the fairway. Remember when Mike discussed using your tendencies? Well, that is an important factor in managing the golf course instead of letting it manage you. Now let's join Mike for a valuable lesson on how to use the most important distance in the game to your advantage. Now we're gonna talk about strategies. One of the biggest mistakes I see with amateurs is they come up to the tee, they automatically walk up here with the driver. They don't even look at the hole or take into account how they're playing. It's just, it's a par four or a par five. I'm just gonna stand up and hit driver. It's probably one of the biggest mistakes you can make. So I've played this golf course before, and so I know that there's some strategies that I need to use. When I'm looking at this card, I, I, I notice that, okay, the hole is 390 yards long. All right, but I also know there's a lake down there, and there's also a slope. So I could hit driver, but I'm not really sure. Maybe I'm not playing that well that day, or I'm not hitting my driver that well. And the other, the other question is, is it really worth hitting? 
For most people, if you can just get the ball somewhere within 150 yards of the green, you're going to be pretty good. If you try to get it a lot closer, you bring in the risk of can you control the driver and how does the hole affect you? In other words, is there a lake down there? You know, what's going on? Do you have to be really precise with your shots? You don't have to hit driver off every hole that's a par four or a par five. In fact, most of the good players in the world don't do that. They're playing to their strengths and they're using strategies to play the hole to the best of their ability based on how they're playing that day. So don't just assume because you're coming up to the tee that it's a driver because it's a par four or par five. That may not be the club to hit. Now what we need to do is we need to find out what's out there so we know what club it is we're gonna use off this tee and what gives us the best chance for success. This hole has a very wide fairway. So there's a lot of room here if you go to the right spot. Now, if you look at the hole from the tee, what you can see is we're sloped down to the 150. Now from the back tee, I can get to that 150 with about a four or five iron. Because of all the slope in the fairway, I don't have to hit it that total distance. It's gonna run all the way down to that 150 marker. Now at the 150 yard marker, I have about 60 yards wide a fairway to hit to. That's a, that's a lot of room. If I go another 50 yards further or 40 yards further, if I try to hit my driver, yeah, it'd be nice to be up around 100 yards, but now I only have about 20 or 25 yards max of fairway to hit to, and then I've got water and trees. So this hole, it's not worth the risk to hit the driver. Even if you hit it well, you're not guaranteed of a birdie. All right, now we understand what the hole's all about. So we know where the lake is, we know where the 150 is. We also have seen that there's a big drop off in the fairway, which is gonna make the ball run a lot further. Now I have a couple of options here. I can try to hit the driver, which I'm gonna do so we can take a look at what that would do if I hit a good one. Now we've hit the driver out there. Now we'll go down and we'll take a look at where that is. The reality though, this hole with the way it slopes, you really don't need to hit the driver because when we go down and look at it, we'll see how narrow it is where the lake is. So the risk reward here relative to the hole probably isn't worth it. Now when we're talking about course management, one of the best drills all of you could do for course management, if you just go out and take your favorite club, take a seven iron or a six iron, whatever club you know you can get in the air, control the distance it goes and pretty much where it goes, go out and play 18 holes with that club, your sand wedge and your putter. What you'll find is you may amaze yourself at the scores that you shoot because now you're forced into management. Let's say you're 200 yards away from a green and you've got your seven iron and there's a lake. Well, you can't hit your seven iron 200 yards, so what are you gonna do? Well, you'll find an area to hit to that makes your next shot a lot easier. That's called course management. That's how good players play. Everybody does that at every level. So taking that one club out will really help you. Now, what I'm gonna do, I'm going clear down to a five iron. And the reason I'm going to hit a five iron is what that will do with this yardage is it'll get me over the first hill. When the ball gets over the first hill, it'll run down and I'll get down there pretty close to the 150 yard marker, which is really all I need. And the lake is not in play. So this club takes the lake totally out of play. Much easier shot to hit. It's in play. I don't have to worry about where it's going to end up. Now I've got the hole set up for my second shot. Well, here I am. Uh, you know, if I had a ball retriever, I guess I could grab that driver out of the lake. Now, I really hit a pretty good drive, and I didn't miss hit it that far offline, maybe only five or ten yards, but it, it kicked down into the water. So now I've brought bogey, double bogey, triple bogey into play. So again, this is one of those deals where I tried to hit a shot, and I guess if you were playing match play and you were way down, you might go for it. But the reality is you're better off to play to a safer area where you've got almost a guarantee of not making worse than bogey. So if we come back up here, and we walk up here just a little bit further, now it's not a long ways, but because I hit a five iron off the tee, and I had the slope here, the ball runs down here, 
Now I've got myself just inside 150 yards. I have a lot of fairway. If I hit that shot 10 times, I wouldn't be out of the fairway. And now I've got a fairly easy shot up to the green. I'm on a flat lie, so I've not taken the risk, but I've put myself in the best possible position. No, I'm not up there 100 yards away, but the reality is the risk wasn't worth what I was going to get out of it. So one, I hit one in the lake. The other, this one, never going to hit this ball in the lake and probably never going to miss the fairway. So when it comes to course management, another game I'd like you to try is when you look at the scorecards, find the widest part of the fairway and figure out the yardage. You can do that and hit to that yardage. Then when you're looking at the green, forget the flag. Don't even look at the flag. If you look at this flag up here, it's way over on the right-hand side, brings the bunkers into play. Most of you, the flag is like it's sitting there going, come on, you're good enough. You see the guys on TV on Sunday go at the flags. Well, the reality is if you just hit at the middle of the green, you're going to hit a lot of shots closer to the flag than you do when you try to hit at the flag. So just play to the middle of the greens. Play to the biggest part of the fairway. Play to the biggest part of the greens. If you'll do that and you'll be disciplined with it, I promise you'll be taking money from your friends while they're in the water or in the trees looking for their golf ball. If you'll do this, you're going to have a lot more fun with the game. Target strategies and course management. Play to your strengths. Evaluate hole prior to teeing. Play to the widest part of the fairway and green. Play a practice round with your favorite club, sand wedge, and putter. Attempt shots you can execute successfully six to eight times out of ten on average. One of the great things about par threes is that they give us all wonderful risk-reward options. And there is no better example of this than the 12th hole at Augusta National, where that back right hole location has led to the demise of many would-be champions. Jack Nicklaus preferred a safer route between the two bunkers, the higher percentage shot. And I encourage all of you to do that at home. Find the fattest part of the green, the highest percentage shot, and play it. And remember that very few birdies are made outside of 100 yards. One of the dangers of par threes is that, with very few exceptions, all of us can reach the hole in one shot. I say can reach because par threes can be quite troubling and they can be quite intimidating, depending upon whether or not you have to carry the water hazard or a waste bunker or anything else that might keep you from focusing on the task at hand. Now let's listen in as Charlie King gives us his three-step routine that will have all of us hitting more greens on those tricky par threes. I'm here on a relatively difficult par three, only difficult because we've got to go over water and that can be intimidating sometimes. On a golf course, we've got 18 opportunities to tee the ball up, and you should take advantage of all 18, including the par three. So I want you to tee it up, give yourself a perfect lie. Then what I'm gonna have you do is we're gonna go through a three-step routine. So we're gonna go back here, and step one is just standing behind the ball, looking at your distance, looking at the wind conditions that day, knowing how you're playing. Maybe you got your A or your B game, so you gotta decide uh, which club you're gonna choose. So in this case, I've chosen a five iron for the situation. And now, once you've got all that decided, then your second step is you want to come up here and you want to rehearse what you're about to do. You want to give your body a sense and a feel. So we're going to make a swing. And that swing, we want the swing to be very similar, if not exactly the same, as what we're about to step up and do. And then the third step, right here I call this the decision line. So once you cross that line, You've made your decisions, and you've got your club, you've got your swing, and you're going to step up and just copy all that, for better or for worse. So now I'm going to go through that, step up, do my physical routine, the waggles and the, the looks to the target, and then hit the shot. So make sure, use a three-step routine, commit to your shot, and what's going to happen is you're going to have a lot more success because you're taking all the variables out and you're going to have something that's very consistent. 
I couldn't agree with Charlie Moore on some of the things he said about playing these par three holes. And one of them is pegging the ball on the tee. I'm a, my neighbor Jack Nicholas said, uh, when you got a chance to tee it up, tee it up, because it makes it easier. The second thing is when we talked about the idea of using enough club to get it over the water. Now this is actually for a full shot for me, it's a six iron, but I have to hit it perfect. So I'm gonna take a five iron, just make a good swing, but I don't have to lean on it or force it. And that's important. Just because your buddy hits a seven iron doesn't mean you have to. You can maybe hit a five iron, but you might hit it closer. So consequently, those two things are certainly important. And right now, I'm gonna to try to use a little visualization here. I put a shaft in the ground to kind of show me the way that I want my swing plane to go right up that shaft line there, back on the line here, up the shaft line in that direction. But uh, in order to give me another little picture of it, I'm going to take this swing ease, and this is a device that helps you to get rotation in your body. You turn back, you turn through, and the, ro the rubber cord here and swings right up the line with the ball, yellow ball on the end of it. Your hand's grip is very light, and you get the feeling of the swing plane going out to the target. So, with that kind of rehearsal, I'm going to make that same swing, but I'm going to go one step further. You know who the king of aces is? The one who's made more holes and ones than anybody in the world? Mansell Davis, king of aces. How many? More than Ben Hogan? Ben Hogan never had one in competition. Mansell Davis has made 49 holes and ones. Now, how could he do that? He's a professional, but he's not a tour player. The reason he can do it in my estimation is because every time he stands on a par three hole, he pictures the ball going in. And when you do that, when you get a positive visual of something in life and in golf, it really helps you to perform it. So we're going through now, I'm looking up my line, taking my grip, aim and set up, grip, aim and set up, distance from the ball. I'm looking up the plane right there and I'm watching the ball go in the hole. And here we go. There we are, just as exactly as we planned it, even up to the line so well that we put it right on that shaft. And that's how you play par threes better. Par three tactics. Always tee your ball. Utilize three-step routine. Take enough club to easily carry trouble. Picture your ball going into the hole. How can you love something one minute and hate it the next? I'm talking about fades and draws, hooks and slices. And I'm sure whether you hit one or the other, you just wish you could hit it straight. And then on the very next hole when you come to a dogleg, you would give anything to shape it in the appropriate manner. So what's it going to be? Are you going to hate those fades and draws or love them? Gary and Mike tackle these tough shots, tell us how they happen and how to fix them. And I guarantee using the techniques that we're about to reveal the next time you go to the range could change your game forever. And when you understand the secrets to hitting these shots whenever you want, you're gonna love being able to control the ball flight. In order to develop accuracy in your golf game, it's important to be able to understand the principles of shot shape. I mean, after all, you have to control your ball in order to control the score, and if you understand what causes the shot shape, whether it's straight or draw, fade or slice, you'll be able to improve your game and improve your accuracy. Now, the black portion here where the club face is represents the face position. The other position is the path, the red right here. Now, when the club face is open to the path, you'll always get a slice, either a fade for a small amount or if it's open a lot, it'll be a big slice. Whenever it starts to close a little, it'd be a draw and a big closing would be a hook. Now, if your problem happens to be a hook in golf, I'm gonna demonstrate some things, the causative factors, and then some things you can do also to be, not only to be able to stop it, but to produce it when you would like to. We're gonna show you some of those things right now, and they start with grip. Good golf starts with a good grip. Ben Hogan has spoken. 
When your hands rotate too far underneath the club so that if someone were to pull it away from you when you had it to your, towards your stomach and pull your arms to extension, you can see how much the club face is closed. Another way to show it is by to say, to say this, if your hands are rotated this way, you put them on the club too far over on the top, and then you say, let your hands and arms relax to their natural position, how that's natural, now the club face is open. Just the opposite would be this way, if my hands rotated underneath and I said, now relax your hands, again, the club face goes to close. So if you're hitting lots of hooks, the first place you look is at the grip. And the grip position would be, should be such that your hands come from a natural hanging position this way and simply place them on the club. Now if I take them off, watch my hands, they just hang in their natural position like this. I'll bring them again in, take them apart, off, they're in their natural position. If they were incorrect, they would look like this. My right hand comes off, look where it's hanging, I say relax, there, it's turned that much and that means it can influence the club face tremendously. Now another way you can check yourself is if you just place a little T right here in the notch between your thumb and index finger in both of your hands, right there, and if those two T's match up in this fashion and come somewhere between your chin and your right shoulder, then you have your hands rotated in the correct position. You see the hook again, your T's would point way to the outside of your right shoulder. So in curing the hook, there are two things that you do. One is, first of all, you check your positions, grip position first. The second position you check is, as you take your club back to the top of the swing, if your left, back of your left hand arches in this fashion, that shuts the face. Right now, the face is in a shut position at the top. If I were to bring it forward like this, you can see how shut that was. So you can have a good grip, but if you go to the top of your backswing, and when you go to the top of your backswing, you shut the face, you still are going to be hitting hooks. The third reason, and most primary, primary reason of hitting hooks, is deceleration of the left arm. Now, if I make a good swing and I come to the bottom, my shaft lines up again with my left arm. But if my left arm slows down too much and my right hand catches up, it can catch up actually for two reasons. Deceleration of the left or trying to overpower with the right. And when it comes to the ball, the face looks like this again. The club face is shut. Now, a shut club face is always going to produce a hooking ball. Even if your path is out to the right, it may start a little to the right, but it'll hook back to the left. So the hook comes primarily from club face position, influenced not as much, but somewhat by the path as well. So that's what makes the ball spin. So a, a shot that comes off with a hook comes this way, this way, a shot that comes off with a slice comes this way, just the opposite. Now, we're going to show you also, if you want to hit shots that are intentional draws or hooks and even intentional fades or slices, I'm going to show you two ways to do it. One, let's just have a kind of a little bit of fun here with a piece of sporting equipment that you're quite used to, a ping pong paddle. I'm going to take a top spin backhand shot. There we go. See what's happening? The paddle is turning over. You see the black part, you see the red part. My left hand turned over, my left arm forward, uh, rotated and my left arm stayed against my side. That's how you close the club face. Now when we want to open it or fade it or slice it even, the left arm would leave and you'd see the black all the way. There is no rotation here. It stays with the back of the hand facing the sky rather than the palm of the hand facing the sky. So that's one way that you can work the ball either with a draw, fade, slice, or hook. Now, what we also can do is we can pre-shape it. Rather, that's a motion that you're doing there, but you can pre-shape it by doing this. If you would think of it in a, oh, maybe a Scotsman might say, if you want to hitch a ride to heaven, that's how you do it. Now, what was that? If you want to hitch a ride to heaven, this is how you do it. You get your thumb facing to the sky. That's how you're hitching the ride. So if you wanted to hit a straight ball, you see that's going to heaven. 
You want to hit a straight ball. When you get to this part of your swing, that's where your th thumb's going to face. Now, if I wanted to hit a draw, what I would do is I would take my left arm and left hand out here, and I would turn it over, not to 12 o'clock, but to 10 o'clock. Left arm in, thumb facing 10 o'clock over here, and I would hold the club there for a count of 10. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That, when I swing to that position now in my golf swing, right through to that position, I will get a draw or hook. If I want to fade the ball or slice it a bit, I'd have my thumb pointing at 2 o'clock out here. Now my left arm's leaving my side, my thumb's pointing at 2. I hold the club. This is pre-shaping. See, I'm doing this before I hit the ball. There it's pointing at 2 o'clock. Now I swing through that position and the ball will go out turn left to right for a right-handed player and you've got a fade or a slice. That might also help you to understand why you are slicing or hooking because you might be doing one of those two things. Now I'd like to demonstrate for you a low shot, the principle of how to keep the ball low and also show you an intentional low and draw both. So hitting a ball low, one of the ways that we can do it as far as understanding the principle is the relationship of this end to that end, the top to the bottom. Whenever the grip end is farther forward, you're going to de-loft the club face. When it's farther back, you're going to add loft. So I want a lower shot with an iron. I can play the ball back farther in my stance. That tilts the shaft forward. If I have the ball farther forward, it tilts the shaft backward. So the, one of the simplest ways is simply angling the grip end of the club forward to hit it low. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate to you now. In teeing a ball lower, obviously you have a better chance to hit the ball low, so a low tee position gives you that opportunity. But I'm going to show you a slightly different one. I'm going to actually tee the ball high here. That gives me a more level more level swing as opposed to a swing with more descent. When you hit with more descent, you put more backspin on the ball and that causes it to rise. So I'm going to hit one from a lower level swing, a level swing here, and I'm just going to suspend my club a little bit in the air above the ball like it's, I'm going to try to hit it slightly above its center. And then I said advance the club head, uh, keeping the club head back, advance the hands forward so the shaft is now tilted toward the target. So here we go, low tee shot, just like I were playing in Scotland. There we are. So there you have it, shaping your shots. You learn to shape your shots, you're gonna to learn to control your ball and that's gonna control your score. Now we're gonna talk about some tips or some drills to help you fix your slice or control the trajectory that you hit the golf ball on. Everybody wants to fix something, but it's knowing what to fix and how to do it. The biggest problem most people have, most people, is slicing the golf ball. So that's the one we're going to go at first. When it comes to a slice, obviously we know that the reason that you slice the golf ball is because when the club face runs into the ball, the face is wide open. So that puts side spin, makes the ball slice. The question becomes, how do we fix that club face? Well, the simplest fix is to take a look at where your grip is. The first thing, most people tend to grip the club too much in the palm of their left hand, and their left hand is rotated too much to the left. So what happens when they come into the ball and the club elongates their arm and it goes back to where it hangs natural, the face is wide open. So what happens with most people, then they try to fix that by rotating their shoulders or their body. If you would just first make sure the club is more in your fingers, and then when you put your left hand, fold it down on top of the club and put your left thumb just on the side of the shaft, not on top, put it just on the side. If you get your left hand on there correctly, now your right hand comes in and your right palm goes right up against the back of your left thumb, and your right palm is facing the target. Don't get your right hand on top where your palm is facing over to the left because its role is to pressure that shaft right into the back of the ball. So if the left hand's on there where you can square the face easier, and your right hand's on there where you can support the shaft, now when you make a swing, now you've got a good chance of squaring the club face on the ball. 
That's the first and probably the easiest fix. The next fix for slice becomes, we talked about the body moving too quick. And what you see with a lot of people is they get back and they push off their right leg and they twist like this and they're falling all over the place. Well, that's an attempt to push off the ground and help the club face with your body. Well, if you do that, it's going to be very difficult because when your body jumps and takes off, the face is way behind, then you try to fall back to hit it. That's what you see most people doing. They jump and they fall back and try to hit. So a good drill to help to calm that down, you get set up, then you drop your right foot back so that your right toe is just behind your left heel or maybe even a little further. Then we're going to make a swing and we're going to hit the ball and your right heel has to stay on the ground until after you've gone past the ball. Now I can keep mine down. If you can just keep yours there until after you hit it, it'll slow your chest and your body down. It'll make it a lot easier for you to get your arms to accelerate past you. So it looks like this. If you've done those two and you're still struggling a little bit, the next thing becomes, how do you get that club head to the ball? One of the biggest misconceptions in golf is that you get to the top and you pull down with this left hand. That's a feeling that a lot of good players have, but the reality is from the top of your swing, as you start down, you want to turn that club face and that club head into the ball. So you get to the top and you want to take that club face and turn it out and down to the ball. So we're going to do that now. Now once you've done that, now we've covered two or three areas that are really big relative to how the face works. One was what you do with your grip. Two, how you release the club. Three is what your body does to sink it out with your arms. So if you go through those three, I'm sure you'll find one of them that will really help you with straightening out the curve on the ball. Now we want to talk about trajectory. If you want to hit the ball higher, what you want to do is a couple of things. One, you can move a little further away from the ball, so now the club's going to come in on a shallower angle. Two, you can move the ball a little further forward in your stance, because that then adds loft to the club face. So if I want to hit it higher, moving away, adding a little loft, That helps me hit the ball a lot higher. If you work on those two or three tips and combine the three, work on first getting the curve you want, then work on the trajectory. Now a lot of people, what they want in golf, they want to hit just that little fade or just that little draw. After being around Jack Nicklaus now for about 20 some odd years, one thing he does, now this is the best player, so you might take this to heat. Once you get a certain pattern going, if you just set the club face a little bit different, so if you want to hit a little more fade, set the face a little more open to start with, then take your grip, make your normal swing. If you want to hit a little more draw or not as much fade, set the face a little more closed. Use those little adjustments with the club face and the ball position before you try to make major changes in your swing. Most people don't have time for that. So start with the little changes, if they don't work, then we've got to go to some bigger changes. I know if you'll do those, practice them just a little bit. I think you'll find the ball flight and the distance you want and the accuracy. Ball flight, cures for hooks and slices. Hooks come from a closed club face. Proper grip should come from hands at natural hanging position. To promote draws, turn over lead hand. Angle grip end of club forward at address to promote lower shots. Slices come from open face at impact. For proper grip, ensure your club is in the fingers of your lead hand. Practice shots by placing right foot back in stance after setup. To promote fades, address club head slightly open and make normal swing. To achieve higher ball flight, move slightly away and play ball forward in stance. got to believe one of the biggest hurdles in teaching is getting your students to understand cause and effect. Now, Dr. Gary Wiring earlier in this video talked about the club face at impact, but in this room, you can give your players, your students, exact measurements 
to make the changes they need. Yes. Here, here in the PGA Learning Center technology room, we can measure path of the club, club face angle, descending angle of the club, where on the ball the club hit, the launch angle of the ball, the speed of the ball, so we get all the information on the swing. And then what happens is players can understand how much or how little they had to change in order to change the flight of the ball. Without being influenced by trying to hit good shots out on the range, having said all that, I'm going to try and hit one of the hardest shots in golf to hit, the straight shot, right now. All right. <laughs> Here we go. Rick, I wouldn't put a lot of money on myself hitting this shot very often, but this is the hardest shot to hit by many people's account, the straight shot. And straight is because the path was perfectly square and the face was open less than half a degree. So it was perfectly straight to your eye. It fell just the tiniest bit to the right. We see that you hit the ball in the center of the club face again, which you do repeatedly, and with a slightly descending angle. So that caused the ball to fly almost dead straight. Little bit of luck involved here pulling off the straight shot. Now let's go hit a shot that, as I mentioned earlier, you see way too often, that big slice. Well, you'd have to work to do it. <laughs> Keep the club face open. That should do it. Obviously, I didn't square the club face up right here, and that's why we got a big slice. And this is the classic slice. The path is slightly across, starting the ball a little left. The face is wide open, overriding the path and sending the ball way to the right. You still hit it in the center of the club face, so you got good distance, but there was so much side spin, it cost you a lot of yardage, and you're in the right rough hunting for it. Sometimes a big antidote for that slice is to try and do the opposite thing, hit the big hook. Let's, well, let's go try go to hit, hit that. One. You got it. That was hooking. It's a little bit harder for me to hit a big hook, but uh, prerequisite, I'm sure, is a big inside-out path, and we got that right here, didn't we? Yes, and this was the opposite to your slice. The path is four degrees inside because you shut your body much more and swung from the inside. Your club face is almost square. So what you hit here was a path hook which started out to the right and curved back to the target, giving you very solid contact and a lot of distance. Also, the ball's going lower because the face is closing much more as it goes through the ball. So this would get you to the back left pin or to the back left side of the green, and it would also get you more distance. Rick, they say the proof is in the pudding, and I'm sure these numbers don't lie. Now, we have hit a straight shot, a big slice, and a big hook. But the trick, I'm sure, that you want to achieve, and I certainly want to do, is turn that slice into a fade and turn that hook into a draw. And obviously, the very first thing in your case it wasn't a problem is you've got to hit the ball in the middle of the club face. If you're not hitting the ball in the middle of the club face, fix that first. Once we're hitting it in the middle of the club face, we look at the path of the swing. And most paths are fairly repetitive. Then we match the amount the club face is open or closed to that path for what we want the golf ball to do. So by adjusting the club face, and hopefully we can do it during the address position or the grip, we can change the flight of the golf ball. So we can rein these big slices in, get a more manageable fade. Let's try and hit one. All right. Rick, there are some things that we can do at address that will allow us to control our golf shots. What are some examples? Well, path, of course, is the easiest one to change at address. Since Gary's already talked to you about grip, let's talk about address posture, okay, okay. how it controls path. When you get set, what we see the good players, good ball strikers do is their body is approximately square to the target line, their shoulder line. Now, if you were going to hit a slice, you would probably have your right shoulder closer to the ball and the line across your shoulders would be open, as opposed to someone that's hitting the ball from the inside and drawing it more will have a path that's aimed much more to the right with their body. By squaring up your path and making it match your club face, we can control the flight of the ball. I'm trying to hit it just a little fade here, so I'll have my shoulders just a little bit left, and we'll try and rein in that nasty slice that we were talking about. Rick, this is the shot that I love to hit, just a slight fade. And what I see right here is that you really are not coming that far across it, and the club face is not really that open, is it? No, it's a combination of your path is 
two degrees open, your club face is one degree open, which is just slightly falling left to right. You got it in the center, the descending angle was correct, so that caused you to hit a very solid ball that fell from left to right at the top of its arc. Knowing that your fade is your normal favorite shot, let's see you make adjustments to hit that little draw. Bit of a challenge for me, but like you said, I'm gonna close my shoulders a little bit and uh, strengthen my grip. We'll give it a go. Rick, it is important to have a go-to shot, but it's equally important to be able to work the ball in every direction. We were trying to hit a little draw right here. We did it with a slightly into out path and yet my club face was still open. How do you do that? Well, you changed your address position and kept your body back so you didn't rotate as fast with the club face, but your path was more from inside. So the ball was struck on the inside, squared up, and started just right at the target and came back. Didn't come back as much as you might have liked, which would have been the club face. But you hit it in the center, the path was good, and we like that. You were able to make adjustments in your address position, and if you had adjusted the grip more, the club face would have been shut more. So as a player, you learn to make adjustments to hit all of the different shots. And for you as a player, find your local PGA professional on PGA.com and help them, let them help you make adjustments to all the different shots you want to hit. Technology, club head face at impact. Try adjusting your body position at address to help achieve your desired ball flight. For left to right ball flight, place right shoulder closer to the ball with shoulders more open. For right to left ball flight, place left shoulder closer to the ball with shoulders more closed. See your local PGA professional for adjustments to hit all your desired shots. Well, you have the perfect tee time at 10 o'clock in the morning, and you're going to plan to get there early enough to warm up. Oh, sometimes even an hour ahead of time would be great, because then you can do the putting and the bunker play and all the rest. But even 30 minutes would help. However, a lot of times, things happen in your life. The interstate was crowded. Uh, the phone, too many phone calls just before you wanted to leave. Somebody comes over the house, and you get to the golf course at 10 minutes to 10, not enough time to go to the range and warm up. So what do you do? Well, I'm going to show you because you're just going to have time to get your shoes on, get your clubs and get to the tee and you're going to be up in a couple of minutes. This is called a no ball warm up. Now what happens so often is people just take their driver out of the bag. They've gotten to the tee. You're on the tee now. They want to take a swing at a cigarette butt or a dandelion or something like that. And they say, all right, what are we playing for? Well, that's not good enough because your muscles, tendons, and ligaments aren't ready to move. You need to do some kind of stretching and a little bit of motion to get yourself ready to hit that first good tee shot. And I'm gonna show you in the no ball warm up how to do that. First, you start with your two wedges, your two heaviest clubs in your bag. We're gonna swing these from the right side to the left side, going from hip height right here, just small at first, using your small muscles, your arms and hands, letting the clubs be very light. Notice where the clubs are going here. They're going up to, up to pointing to the sky in the back swing, and right here they're pointing to the sky in the through swing. That shows that my hands are relaxed, not tight. Back and through. And I'm just taking a kind of a baseball grip around the clubs to do this. Now I'm going to shoulder height, a little farther through, so a little more stretching here, a little more stretching. Now I'm going to pick up the speed and go more into a full swing. Picking up the speed, picking up, there we go. Back, right foot to left foot. The footwork's very important here, that you go over the right side and then over the left side. Now, when you pick up your driver, which sometimes feels heavy for you when you start the day, now it feels like a light feather. It just almost floats away because those were so much heavier. That's important because if something feels light, you don't squeeze it tightly, you grip it lightly. And that is important to get speed in the golf swing. Now the next part of the no ball warm up is to put the club behind your back this way, in your elbow so that you turn back and turn through. You turn back and turn through, stretching the lower part of your back. Now we're gonna put it up over the back of our head. This time it's gonna go this way, over the back, stretching, pulling it down, turn back, turn through, 
turn back, turn through, and now drop it from there so your thumbs are hooked over. Raise it high in the air. Not, don't hurt yourself now, but just enough so you can feel a good stretch. Stretching back and through, and back and through. And now, when you get done with that, your arms feel nice and long and loose is what you want. You want the feeling of that thing being light and loose like that. And you are ready to start your pre-shot routine. Now here's what I add to that. I go then from behind the ball, taking my club and shortening down just a little bit, taking a couple swings where I make sure my left side gets through the swing like this to the target. Then we get behind it, look out at your target there where you want the ball to go, visualize your target, go through your pre-shot routine, which is grip, aim, and setup, take a practice cut to get the used to the speed now with a club that is nice, feels nice and light, ball position, aim, 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 and make your swing. And there we are, right down the middle, and are you happy to get off successfully on the first tee? No ball warm-up. Start by making half swings with two wedges. Gradually increase to full swings. Then utilize driver behind lower back and shoulders. Here's something I love to do. I start out by hitting a low punch fade. Then I'll try to hit a low straight shot and a low draw. I come back and repeat the process and vary my trajectories on every shot. The point is I'm playing shots and I'm finding out where my particular strengths and weaknesses lie. Now let's join our PGA professionals as they show us some more great practice routines. Now we're going to talk about practice. You've already warmed up, you're stretched, which is a key whether you're coming out to play or practice. But we've already done that, so we're stretched out. Now we're going to start working on practicing. Now, the biggest mistake that most amateurs make is when they come to the range, they don't decide whether they're here to practice their swing or whether they're warming up to go out and play. Two very different topics and very different ways to approach the game. Let's take practice first. So we're going to come out here today to practice. So the first thing you want to make yourself aware of is we want to talk about what we're trying to accomplish with this club face and this golf ball. When you look at a golf ball, when you hit it, you want to catch the ball on the face. You don't want to go underneath it to lift it in the air. So we're catching it on the face. So you can see that the shaft is leaning forward. So we're catching the ball on the face. So what we've got to do is we have to establish right off the bat what that feels like, especially in your practice sessions. Now, if we're going to do that, there's a real easy drill for everybody to try. What you do is you set up to the golf ball and you put the ball way behind your right foot and you take your left hand and all you're going to do is roll the ball and toss it out there. Now that makes it so you can't scoop underneath it. So now you take your right hand, you do the same thing. Then you take both hands and you're going to roll the ball. Then you move the ball into the center of your stance. Now we're establishing that same feel for impact because that's the key to the game is being able to impact the golf ball correctly. Most people don't have a sense of what that is. So you want to do that little roll the ball so you feel what it feels like at impact to have the shaft leaning forward. Now, once you've done that, now we've got to start to build the swing. One of the first things we want to do with the swing is right here with this tennis racket. Now, I came up with this, or I saw it, and so I started to use it. Initially, it was just a regular racket, but I put a, a shaft in it and a grip because one of the biggest things in golf is to understand how to release the club through the ball. And you can see here that if I do it correctly, I can see only the back of the racket. Most people, when they take this tennis racket the first time, their tendency is to flip, so they can't see the back of the racket. Now, a golf club is very confusing because it has loft in it, the head shape different, it's a long ways away. So this tennis racket makes it very easy for people to see what it means to release the club face correctly. And that gives you a whole different feel in your forearms 
as to what you're supposed to do. Now, a very good drill is to take this racket, and now we're going to set it on the back of the ball, and now I'm going to throw the ball down the target line. If I release it the way most people do, the ball will go way to the left. So the goal here is to set the ball on the racket and throw it down the target line. That way, if you're here, the ball goes left. If you release it correctly, the ball goes down the target line. Now you have a sense of what it feels like to release the club face through the ball or how the club works through the ball. Once you've established that, now we've got to start making a little bit longer swing. Well, when we start making longer swings, one of the hardest things for people to do is to understand how to hinge their wrists and have the club face work correctly. This little swing guide here helps you to understand that. When you watch most tour players, you'll see them standing and they're making this kind of move. They're standing there talking to each other, and this looks real cool. Okay, but the reality is this is a very important part of the golf swing how this club works and how you hinge and unhinge the club is critical to being able to play. If you can't do this, everything else you do in the swing assumes you can. So this becomes a very important practice tool to feel and sense how your wrists work. Now, once we take that, now we're going to go to a fuller swing. Well, on the back swing as you go back, that hinges and touches your left forearm. As you come down into the ball, it comes off. You make impact with the ball. On the follow-through side, it hinges back up, and it's back onto your left forearm. So when you start out now, and we're practicing, focus on the drill that you're working on. So we're going to set up. We're going to focus on making that hinge, and then we're going to try to run into the ball. But the goal was getting a feel for what the club was doing and how it works. Then very gradually you start to build the speed up, you change clubs, you go back and forth between your teaching aid or your drill and what you're trying to do. So it's critical when you're practicing that you have a very set reason for being there. Now if you notice I have clubs on the ground. You always want to establish a target line and establish this other line here, which is not necessarily just for your feet. A lot of good players play from a closed stance, some play from square, some play from open. But they all have a really good sense of the target line they want the ball to go down and how they set their eyes and their chest relative to their target line. So this is critical that you do this all the time. Now the other thing that you have control of is your grip and your posture. Everybody, go to your golf professional, go to your PGA professional, let him make sure that the grip that you're using and the posture and the things you have control of, that you're doing those correctly. If you're not doing those correctly, the rest of the game just becomes a mass amount of confusion. So when you're here to practice, be very precise about the drills that you're using, stay focused on the drills, and make sure that you're accomplishing what you want in your swing. Do about a three to one ratio. Three drills, one without the drill. Three drills, get the feel, one without it. Go back and forth. Don't just do the drill. Don't be afraid to use those drills when you're on the golf course also, if you're practicing your swing. Now we're gonna go to play. Playing is a very different approach when you come out to the range. Now we're gonna warm up. We're not trying to necessarily work on your swing, you're trying to warm up and get ready to play. Now, most people start out with the sand wedge. I don't think that's the way to go. I start out with my driver. Now, the reason I start with this, I want to build my rhythm around this club. This is the hardest club for most people to hit, and if you're not careful, by the time you get to hit it, you're already swinging too fast. So the key to warming up is we're going to get into a rhythm. Now, I want you to take out your driver, and we're going to get set up to the ball. Now once you're set up, we're making a nice big full swing, but you're not going to hit it very far. You're not trying to swing fast. We're just back and through and trying to make solid impact with the ball and get a feel for controlling the face. So you're trying to get a feel for your balance and for your rhythm. You make a big swing and hit it about one-fourth the normal distance. Then very gradually, 
you're going to build up the speed. So now I'm going to hit this about 20 to 30 yards further than I hit the last one. But I'm going to do the same thing. It's a nice, big, long swing. And all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make sure I make nice, solid impact. And I'm going to make the ball go a little further. Now, I'm only going to warm up or increase the speed to about 50 or 60 percent of my maximum. So I'm feeling the rhythm. I'm feeling all of the sequence. So I'm timing everything. I'm maintaining my balance. That's a critical thing, especially with this club. The biggest mistake people make with the driver is you swing out of your ability to control your rhythm and your balance and square the face. That's what it's all about. So you start with this and you warm up with some nice big swings. Just hit it solid and watch where it's going. Try to hit it in the center of the face. Then, now we're going to go back. Now we go back and now we start with the sand wedge. Now we're going to go back to the sand wedge and very gradually we're going to hit balls. We're going to hit them solid and build the speed up again and work our way back up through the clubs. Now when you're out here practicing, you're working on something particular. Now we're getting ready to play. So we're working on our rhythm. We're trying to hit the ball solid and the focus as you're, as you're working up through your shots is to see what your tendency is. You're not trying to fix your swing. You're just trying to make solid impact, keep your rhythm and balance, and watch what the ball's doing in the air. Because you're going to have a tendency. Then the goal is to go out on the golf course and play your tendencies. The biggest mistake most people make when they try to play golf is they're trying to do something that they don't do naturally. So they're trying to fix their swings. That's not the goal here. The goal is to go out and play. So you start with the driver, nice long swings, very gradually build the speed up, try to hit it solid, watch what it's doing in the air. Then you start, go back to your sand wedge, build your swing up. If it's a windy day, maybe you want to hit some low shots to get a feel for how you're going to do that. Now you're ready to go play. You go hit a few putts, you walk out to the course, you go play. When you get through, you evaluate what happened, so then you know what to go practice. That's a whole nother thing, which we talked about before. If you'll do these things, go to your PGA golf professional. Let him help you with what drills you need. You're going to have so much more fun with the game watch, once you differentiate between practice and play. Have a great time with the game. Let's get one thing straight right now. You cannot get better without practice. Now, practice makes permanent. Whatever you're practicing, you're going to get good at. But what you want to understand is you want to practice correctly. So, practice works when you practice correctly. That's why you go to your professional to get information about what you should be practicing. So, I'm going to show you a few things that I do on the practice tee. And right now, I'm hitting a driver. I've already warmed up. So, with this driver shot, I picked out a couple flags out there, and I'm going to count a kind of a score, keep score of what I'm doing, and I try to get it between the flags. And so uh, I'm going to hit 10 shots, and we'll see if, how many I can get in that space. That gives me a little bit more of an objective, a goal, as I make my swings, and as I make my shots and say, there's one, oh, that's borderline. So can't count that one. But we get another one up here, and we try to get as many as we can. I put the balls a little ways away from me, so I just can't stand here and rake one in, rake one in. I kind of have to move around so I go through my routine again. Now this routine going right down the middle, pay a little attention, check my grip, get my club in the right position, wrist cock, here the target. Now we're going to swing right up the line and let her go. And that's the way I want to hit it. So that's another example uh, of doing sensible, correct practice. Another thing we can do is play with a partner. I'm going to take an iron here, and I'd imagine I've got a partner with me. We're going to play the three-point game. And we're picking a target out there, and we're going to hit a shot, and whoever's closer on line to the flag gets the point. So I'm going to go first here, take my swing, go down the target line, see where that one goes. And all right, see if you can beat that one, buddy. So we got it in there about five yards off the line is all. And if he plays and doesn't get it close, then I get one point. First one of three wins. Then we change clubs. We go through the whole bag that way. But it puts pressure on you, just like on the golf course. 
and it's much better, it's a wonderful way to practice, much better than just standing here hitting ball after ball after ball. Now all practice doesn't have to be at the golf range. You can also practice at home. You can stand in front of a mirror or a window, take your swings, check your swing plane, out, back swing length. You also can chip balls into the sofa with a sand wedge. You can putt on the carpet to a tee. Lots of ways to practice. But the thing you must understand is this, that you can't get better unless you practice. So do it. Great practice routines. Establish the feel of the ball on face at impact. Create specific routine and stay focused. Play games by yourself or with partner. Simulate core situations on the range. I'm sure you can see why Mike Malaska and Dr. Gary Wyron are considered two of the top PGA instructors. And I hope you learn some valuable lessons on how to improve your game and your satisfaction in playing. Don't forget the drills and tips that you learned today. And as Gary said, when playing a tee shot or any other shot for that matter, visualize success. And remember to go to PGA.com and find a local club professional in your area to help you apply the lessons learned today. And please join us for some more valuable lessons in the next PGA Golf Instruction video series. <laughs>